How do all we are live? And I have no idea where the chat is, but I'm sure I'll find it. <laughs> oh, yay, there's people. Hey. We are doing great. This is actually, we're done here. It's the start of us actually having a weekend. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, if you jump on, we'll get started here in about four minutes. Let us know who you are, where you're from, all that. Hey, man. And I just assume my volume's on. I don't actually know. Well, that was my next question. Thank you. <laughs> Pardon me, I'm stuffing my face before we get started. No, I do not want to start video chatting with Bob. Hmm? I said, no, I do not want to start video chatting with Bob. <laughs> that would be disruptive. Yes, yes, it would. We got a couple folks who sent in some questions, so I'm super excited about that. Are you on Bob or Traditions? Uh, traditions, I believe. I'm sorry, puppy. And Cody the dog is here as well. Hey. See, those are all the athletic pointings. That's mm -hmm, yeah, let's, let's not worry about that right now. I'm just trying to, I can't yep. even get to your thing. Ah. Oh, now I see a chat. Hey, there we go. I caught up. Okay, I'm there you go. North Carolina, outstanding. Mm -hmm. Tucson, Tucson, right above that. Heck yeah, Michigan. We got people from all Holy over. Cow. I love it. Mm -hmm. So what is this, our third time doing this? Mm -hmm. I'm going to start uh. writing down stuff too. Yeah. Because I see questions already in the chat. How do you see questions before me? That's you not. Oh, Portland. Oh, you're an AP or an AP school. Outstanding, Jennifer. Okay. I've heard nice things about the school out there. Pardon me. Sucking down iced tea for extra caffeine to do this. <clears throat> what year are you in uh, acupuncture school out there? That's not me. That's not me. And I know we've got um, mostly Irby folks on here, but uh, happy to say um, acupuncture stuff as well, needless to say. And actually, one of our questions here will be um, a little acupuncture. -y. There's no such thing as a little needle. <laughs> it's a light needle. Oh, just starting. That's great. No. Okay. Study hard. It's a lot. Okay. I was going to say, you'll be very close. Eh, not that close, but close enough. You know, this uh, coming October, the uh, American Herbalist Guild Conference is in Colorado. Closer than ever. And uh, yeah, closer, closer than the East hey, Coast. Kristen, what up? 
And um, although there's some Chinese stuff there, uh, there's definitely good nod and great place to start making connections and a lot of acupuncture students and, and uh, practitioners definitely go to the uh, American Herbal Skill Conference. So it's a good way to see the depth and breadth of cool herby stuff. Sorry, I'm being big by the uh, puppy dog, dog here. <laughs> okay. So All right. I'm going you ready? The questioning. All right. right we're now. we're right at six. So I'm scrolling through. So do you uh, want to deal with the ones that came in before? Uh, uh, we'll do a little bit of all of them. And actually, uh, we're just going to... Uh, do an intro. Yeah, I'm going to do that. But uh, energy problems with long-haul COVID, that's a good one. Um, yeah, so we'll do energy. So, um, lots of... I, I love it when I see names and faces that I don't know, as much as I love our students and graduates and stuff when they show up. But... Um, uh, I'll especially do a little intro. Um, I'm Bob, Bob Lindy, and uh, I am a registered herbalist with the American Herbalist Guild and an acupuncture physician here in St. Petersburg, Florida. And uh, and moderating today is my other half, Renee Prince, another registered herbalist with the AHG. And um, we've got the Tradition School of Herbal Studies here. And, you know, COVID has been a, a challenge. Oh, we're in St. Petersburg, Florida. Yeah. Um, and we, we teach Western herbal medicine. We do Chinese herbal medicine. Uh, we supervise an intern clinic for Western and Chinese herbalists, as well as uh, acupuncture physicians from the local acupuncture school here, uh, Sarasota, about an hour away. We've got a couple of students we're always torturing here. And um, animals. Yeah, dogs, cats, goats, whatever. But the. Um, Ultimately, you can find out more about our classes and so forth. But one of my favorite things, you know, I've been doing this for over 20 years now. And um, uh, kind of a diverse background. I was a, a Western herbalist long before I was a Chinese herbalist. Uh, and, and yes, I do do acupuncture still. But yeah, you know, really, I like the herbs. So you can see a small section of our herb pharmacy behind us. And we grow about 150 different plants here uh, in Florida. Some Chinese, Ayurvedic, you name it, we try to grow it here. And um, because of COVID, we've been forced to find new ways. We don't get to go to our conference. We, we don't get to uh, interact as much as we used to. And um, so I've seen a, a few acupuncturists actually doing something similar to this. And although they gave a nice nod to the herbs, I felt like uh, they weren't giving enough um credence to the herbal medicine you know a strong part of of chinese medicine and i didn't feel like anybody was doing this for western herbal medicine so i decided what the heck we get we got an occasional evening free we'll go ahead and see if we can't do uh just as good a job as some of those folks were and uh this is our third time doing Let it let me break into you real quick because yeah. you didn't say anything about traditional healing and that yeah. that we can answer that question too uh, yeah so um as part of the school we do um classes on the weekend uh, that tend to be anything from, I know we've got a flower essence series coming up that uh, leads to certification mm -hmm. um, all the way up to a practitioner. So it's three weekend intensive online and in person. And uh, we've got uh, our 101 for Western herbal medicine. We've already started the Chinese. We start the Chinese system uh, every year in November. We restart the Chinese program, which is two years long. And uh, on Friday nights, regularly we try to do a free class, so we'll do some that are not open forums. I think we've got something on uh, brain stuff. And... Nerves, nervines, and nootropics. Yep. And then the next one is herbs for sexual health right before Valentine's mm -hmm. Day. And um, and then on Thursdays, we tend to do more spiritual-related ones. Uh, we've got... The basic of herbal healing. Yeah, we've got the crystal healing. Crystal healing. Yeah, mm -hmm. we've got crystal healing. So anybody who's interested in that... And it's funny, for Chinese uh, uh, acupuncturists, herbalists, we forget that in our medica, we have so many stones in there. And things like Shi Gao. recognized crystals and stones. Yeah, so the things like Shi Gao, uh, which is selenite, that we do both internally and externally. The Zirong Tong, which is the fool's gold, the iron pyrite. And so many more that are part of our regular medica that we don't talk so, about yeah. often enough. And we did a class last night on uh, ritual bathing. Uh, which is is something that exists in every culture. 
uh, both for physical healing, spiritual healing, religious ceremony, and so forth. And uh, I know for all the, the folks who showed up for that class, hey, oh, Liz, what up? And I was like, <laughs> you made it. I'm glad. Uh, out west. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so we, we know that uh, some of those students may be showing up on here. So Renee is here, although I can sometimes hold my own on some of the spiritual uh and stone question she's certainly more she's more versed in it than i am i would say so all of that is part of the insanity that we do here um so i do you know there was we had a <laughs> well i'm sure Brittany's on here we we had another slew of awesome questions from her but we had a couple that came in uh before her so uh, Kim, one of our graduates who uh, works uh, in, in one of our local stores here and also has her own product line and all kinds of, I know she's doing col uh, consults very successfully. Advisor, yeah. yeah. Um, but it's funny. She asked, uh, you know, maybe covering the herbal opportunities you get during and after taking the program. And like, no, I totally want to like talk all the awesomeness of our program, but I'm going to try to be a, 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 a little kinder. There are many programs out there. And whether you take a, a more formal route like acupuncture school, um, uh, where you get a license and, uh, you know, you get to do fancy things like treat and diagnose. Um, but there's so many different routes uh, towards learning about herbal medicine. And, and I, I will say we have a, the Tradition School of Herbal Studies has a uh, YouTube channel where I've got a, a nice about five or 10 minute video, a little bit about how do you become an herbalist um, and some of the outlets that you can, you can do in order to either as a part-time or full-time herbalist uh, help people uh, make medicine and so forth. And so I, I always like to say that like, no, everybody should take our program. But the reality is there are formal schools like our own, um, although most herb schools are unaccredited. Ours is not. Uh, but we have guidelines set out by the American Herbalist Guild. The American Herbalist Guild, AHG, is our professional organization that kind of sets those quality control standards, both for people to practice as an herbalist, uh, ethical standards, um, and for educational standards, what we think a good herbalist should know, what kind of an education they should have. And there's so many different routes to that. So formal training, yay, go to herb school. Um, but we can also do self-study. There was, you know, before, before there was an internet was when I started studying herbal medicine. And a lot of it, I had, I hate to say it, I had to do on my own with the very limited resources that were available to me. Yeah. And some education just hit and miss through local people and local traditions. I was lucky enough to grow up down in the Bahamas uh, where there was at least one person where I got some level of informal training, I would say, uh, live, <laughs> living and working on a, a commercial fishing boat and uh, diving for conch and lobster down in uh, Abaco. And, uh, it was one of the things that we like to do is sitting on the beach cracking conch in the evening after we'd knocked off for the day that uh, he would sit there, Noel, uh, Noel Boodle, one of my teachers, would sit there and tell me about the plants and the plant medicine and how they would be used in both physical medicine, but even some spiritual medicine uses of those plants. And, you know, at 14 years old, you don't always appreciate that as much as you, you should. Um, and it wasn't until much later that I started to get more formal training than ultimately ran away to acupuncture school and got very formal training and had to take all the, the uh, silly board exams and so forth. But so we can see this lineage, where, whether we're talking uh, Chinese or Ayurvedic or uh, traditional cultures like the, the First Nations people here, in North and Central and South America. But even throughout Europe, there is a traditional culture there with a diagnostic system, with a, a heritage and lineage of, of local plant use. Um, and so a lot of people will study at the feet of somebody who uh, has worked as an herbalist for 10 generations. And so that's always a fascinating, whether you get a little bit or a lot of it. Um, but that journey sometimes is considered to be 13 years long uh, or give or take a day or two. I need to break in a tiny bit and do some housekeeping. Mm -hmm. um, for everybody who's online, there is a slight delay from what Bob's saying. So feel free not only to break in and say something, but to hit me up in the chat. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if we've gone past it because we're on the delay. We'll come back and answer. And I'm ADD, so I can hang. 
to feel, feel very free because we're on a delay to say, hey, hey, what about the question? Don't go forward. Yeah. Um, and, and so what how does an herbalist, you know, uh, pay for their herb addictions? Um, the reality is there's lots of different ways that herbalists uh, survive, exist, thrive. Um, and most of all, I find a lot of the people who gravitate trying to become a professional herbalist are folks who have dabbled in a little bit of everything. They may, they may have made their money or not made their money in, in another profession, but they've been dissatisfied. They don't feel like um, it's nurturing them, that it, it isn't their passion what their job is, uh, even though it provides for a com comfortable living or just uh, a mediocre living even. Um, so we find a lot of people come here as a second, third, fourth <laughs> uh, career. And some people are really about working with the individual, that they love working with a client where they're doing consultations, they're going over health histories, uh, looking at tongue and pulse uh, or whatever system that they work in, whether it's a energetic-based system, a medical system, the, the Chinese, Ayurvedic, uh, so many different cultural heritages. And so the mainstay of what they do is more days than not, they're in there seeing clients and they get paid for their consultation. They may or may not be making the medicine for those clients uh, and selling them that medicine. Other people, you know, yay, COVID, we're now doing online consultations. Uh, can't take a pulse that way, but we can do so much of the energetics and have the conversations that are necessary in order to bring people to that place of balance. And, and you know, I think a lot of people have spoken to me. Uh, a lot of people come to me and they're just like, they just feel disconnected, the discombobulated, whatever language you want to use. But it, it is a tumultuous time. I like discombobulated. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and for many reasons, that it's a, a, a challenging time. And so there, people need help finding, I, I two, maybe three times this week, I talk to people about finding their tribe and where where are the people that are around them and whether that be online or in person in your own town, like how do you find people who nurture you, who think not necessarily the same as you, but have some core beliefs that are shared that you can grow and feel safe with a group of people. And how do we find that? And like sometimes that's what I spend my time talking about as an herbalist. Um, we always end up crying and crying. I always feel bad <laughs> because we cry because we're happy that we're there, and then we cry because we're overwhelmed, and yeah. then we cry because we're leaving. I always feel yeah. bad about it. But the 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 reality the is, I would say that's probably where I I how I make the bulk of my living is, is seeing patients. Um, I sorry, I get to say patients, herbalists say clients. Um, the other thing is medicine making is a very common way, and whether they're people selling that online, there's issues with that. Uh, or selling them at local uh, health fairs and things like that, or even getting them into shops locally is a, a nice way either to make your primary income uh, if, if you've got some skills in that set, but uh, also as a supplemental income. Other people are teachers, and so teaching can be a very good way to make a living. Um, and you don't have to work nine days a week. Sometimes you do. Uh, sometimes it allows for travel if you're a teacher. I, I love going out to conferences and, and teaching. Uh, we go up to Atlanta every year. Eh, not every year. Every couple of years we go up to Atlanta. Uh, we travel around Florida and, and conferences countries. all, yeah, <laughs> different countries. Uh, the uh, and We go to a couple of conferences that I always enjoy. Uh, we always enjoy teaching at. Uh, both in this state and in other states. Um, and then another way to do it is either herb growing or wildcrafting herbs for other herbalists. You know, here in Florida, things like Biden's Alba uh, and Sita are unique to our area here in the tropics and uh, very common herbs to use for a variety of issues, everything from a cough, a uh, lingering cough to uh, Lyme disease related issues. So uh, it can be, uh, and I would say most herbalists and oh, and I forgot writer. A lot of people like to write. I'm not a big writer. I'd do it if I got to. Um, but what I find is most herbalists specialize in one area, but
but they dabble in all the others. And so multiple revenue streams. Yay. Sorry, that's the business class. Yes, Renee. So Jane has a question about, please clarify for you uh -huh. um, who and what like resources and scope of practice you have as an acupuncture, I'm still not clear on what our license affords us. No. And so it's gonna be different. And Jane, if you if you don't mind typing in there where you're from, uh, because with a license, it, it's funny, uh, it's, it's a blessing and a curse. Um, here in Florida, I have a wonderful scope of practice. We're considered um, uh, primary care physicians, so we get to say, uh, fancy words like treat and diagnose. Uh, here in Florida, we're, we're actually now graduates are required to learn injection therapies. I personally didn't do that training. Uh, we've got people here in the clinic that do that. Uh, I'm lucky enough to have uh, other practitioners that here in our, our uh, practice. Oh, you're in Lakeland as an acupuncturist. You do all kinds of crazy things. Uh, <laughs> So uh, here in Florida, as, as an acupuncture physician, 100%, you can utilize herbs in your practice. Let me break in. Bob has sat on your professional board, your your yeah. FASOMA, and so they need to know that, that you guys defend the laws and your rights yeah. and your practices. So he really does know what he's talking about. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, and it, it's funny. The herbal medicine is an unlicensed profession, and there is some gray area for those who are unlicensed. Um but as an acupuncture physician here in Florida, without a doubt, we have prescriptive rights of herbs. And it's well written into, what is it, 457. Sorry, I can quote state statute. Yay. Uh, <laughs> so it, it is something that I would encourage you. It's one of the most powerful tools we have as acupuncture physicians. But it requires a much more precise diagnosis. Um, and so our ability to truly understand why somebody has a, a particular issue or set of issues, our ability to understand how they got there. And as an acupuncturist, your ability to treat maybe the acute issue with the acupuncture and the underlying uh, chronic disorder that allows for that to happen, um, that you will get your patients better, faster, more effectively. Um, and one of the challenges and we're not limited to chinese herbs you can utilize any type of herb and, and i forget the exact verbiage in our scope but it basically says if you've been trained in it uh and you're able to use it effectively that you can use it, it as is, an ap it is um you are trained to the professional standard mm -hmm. whatever yes. that is and, and so it is super correct for you some schools use homeopathy i was not trained in homeopathy at my school um, so I don't really know a whole lot about it. And guess what? I don't use it much. Um, and I chose not to do the injection therapies after uh, uh, school. Um, and so I've chosen to skip that. And I'm super excited that I got other people to do it. <laughs> yeah, come on down, Jane. Oh, check out I'll our classes online. Yeah. Um, and, and so I think it's important because and sorry for all of you who don't have a license I, i'm gonna i'm gonna get a little hoity-toity you and you have so many questions oh here, lordy so. i'll go faster ah. uh, <laughs> the the reality is i practice like a primary care physician i have so many of my patients who see me as their first line and sometimes their last line for health care their truthful line yeah and, and they go to me and they'll contact me before they go and see the regular gp i beg them to go and get go get blood work go get all that stuff but the reality is to be a good healer, to be a good doctor or physician, we should know our Western herbs, whether you practice with them or not, so that we can properly advise. We should know about nutraceuticals in the same way we should know pharmacology to be able to recognize potential side effects or conflicts, even though we don't prescribe pharmaceutical drugs. And, and ultimately be able to have an honest conversation with them about uh, what the, the pros and cons are of prescription medication, and then to work with their doctor to either get it properly adjusted or perhaps working towards getting off of them through diet, lifestyle, and cool Chinese or Western herbs. Um, I got off on some crazy tangent, but... It's okay. So we are talking about... The, <laughs> Give no, me the next one. I, I'm ready to go. Kristen's so, got a good one So what, um, what, what she was saying was... I'm not exactly I'll, sure... I'll find out off my soapbox Yeah, so there. it's okay. So what, what we were saying is, is she wasn't sure what our scope of practice is. It's good for the herbalists that are not licensed to know what their scope of practice is. Yeah. And so we, I feel like you adequately kind of answered that, especially for the state of Florida. We can go into that yeah. more 
if anybody needs to know, we'll shoot an email of some laws and things that you and, can look and at. And I will, that's what I, um, MDs can prescribe herbs if they're trained in it. Uh, chiropractors can prescribe herbs. And ultimately, um, a, an herbalist without a license can recommend, not prescribe. We can teach, educate, suggest, and recommend. Yes. And so it is, it no, literally no comes. Treat, diagnose, or cure. Um, your, the, the population, we have a uh, Health Freedom Act here in Florida that allows uh, our clients, um, our people who come to see us, to make uh, choices about how they choose to pursue uh, their health care. And we make and, it fully present to them in their yep, mind. And, and herbalists uh, have the ability to, as Renee said, uh, edu educate and recommend uh, about herbs that will help bring them to a state of balance. Okay, so there are several people who have several flim questions. So I feel like we should get those but, in one fell swoop because okay. we don't want a flim give, give me the Give me the lowdown on the So we have the, the first thing is... Flim in the triple burner. Oh, Lord. How do we move it through? Not everybody will understand that, but I figured we could, With a come, garden hose. We could uh. combine it. The second one would be um, phlegm related to sugar. Yes, I understand that, but how do I get things straightened back up if you have inflammation and phlegm related to sugar? And then in the middle of that was the energy for the long haul COVID, which yeah. also could involve phlegm. It might involve and so what she did. The understanding of phlegm to the Western herbalist in particular. I thought that's a whole conversation you could go so, crazy on. So, so I'll yeah. keep you on track. Okay. Put them in the triple burner if you want. As as usual, any one of these questions we could spend two hours talking about. And and my great challenge in life is for me to speak to two camps. Uh, one, the folks who are straight up Chinese medicine, uh, and other folks who are like, I don't know anything about Chinese medicine. It's okay, we can break it and down. And may or may not have even an energetic foundation. Um, and, and I'm going to simplify a little bit because the sand shower, triple burner, triple warmer, all these different words for oh, many things. But in this context, we're looking at the fluid metabolism of the body, how moisture moves through our body in a positive or negative way. For the Western herbalist who has an energetic standpoint, we're talking about a wet condition um, we don't necessarily use the term dampness, but we'll use the term phlegm. And for those folks who don't know what the heck I'm talking about, probably the closest uh, approximation is uh, those organs in our body that function to help us control the fluid metabolism, such as the kidney and the lymphatic system, uh, the circulatory system and the digestive system, all kind of interact in order to create that the more perfect fluid metabolism of the body. And we do see when that fluid metabolism is jacked up, um, we see things like uh, fluid accumulation, edema, in, in any number of different parts of the body. We always think about the ankles, but we could have uh, edema in the abdomen, the face, the chest, the hands. Uh, all of those are places where we can get the fluids are not doing what they're supposed to. And from a medical standpoint, any number of uh, different possibilities. Um, can I break into something right there for you? Sure enough. Um, also, understanding from a Western standpoint, because you're not as trained in the term phlegm as, as the Chinese practitioners are, that phlegm then on heat looks like other things that aren't flimmy like it looks like crunchy hard things it looks like stones so making sure that's something that so they know. yeah and so it's it's interesting uh dampness phlegm uh fluid metabolism disruption in chinese medicine particularly starts at the digestion it can come from other places but it's frequently there and um i just had a veggie burger and i'm drinking a cold drink and i did not have a healthy breakfast, but it was sure yummy. Um, and so I'm a little phlegmy and, and I, I have uh, poor digestion from, you know, way too long in the military, uh, too much fun in desert storm and burning oil wells. And so I tend to not process my foods uh, as well as I should. Um, and in particular, so chi deficiency, um, when we start to look at things like food sensitivities and the inflammation that can cause in the body. And my best example for, for the non chinese folks is if I were to be dusting the house and I got a big old glob of dust or pollen or something up my nose, what happens? My body literally takes moisture and tries to wash it out by sneezing, drippy nose, post nasal, all of these things are saying, get something out of your body. 
And so if we eat, make poor food choices and our digestion can't handle it well, we, <clears throat> we start to get a lot of phlegm in our lungs in particular. We would call that, uh, we, we always say the digestion, the spleen is the producer of phlegm and the lung is the container. So that first line of stuff that we get is, I made bad choices. <clears throat> it starts to show up in my lungs. We might end up with a cough, sinuses. We consider the, the lung and the nose connected. Somebody says phlegm equals kapha imbalance, and I wrote back sometimes, but yes. Kind, yes, yeah, kind of. Like so, sub, it can, a kapha person yes. is going to be more inclined towards that mm -hmm. wet uh, body. You know, that wet body type is a boggy body type is going to tend to be boggy or easier. Um, but if we allow for that phlegm, that excess moisture uh, to accumulate longer, it tends to get stagnant. It gets, you know, think of like, if I took a, a glass of juice and I put it on the counter, I could go back in an hour, I could still drink it. Tomorrow, it's going to be a little weird. A month from now, what's that going to look like? It's going to start to dry up. It's going to be smelly. There might be mold growing on it. Uh, fungus, yeast. Um, but the reality is it it literally starts to consume itself and we end up that it gets hotter, it gets sticky to the point where it can get hard. And so phlegm, when we look at it, is too much wet stuff. And I'm, I'm purposely vague here because it is literally too much wet stuff in the wrong places that can be any consistency from clear, drippy, faucet, watery, all the way to hard concretions that you might call something like a tumor. And you could call it a kidney stone. You could call it a fibroid or a cyst. Um, yeah, those are good examples. Yeah. And so how we choose to attack it will depend on where it is and why it is and what state of stickiness it is okay so so let's keep you on track with that okay so i'll in stop particular, I'll, I'll stop vomiting in words yeah, now so so we got a fair understanding of limb and in particular this person is asking about a triple burner mm -hmm. can you treat can you please without sand gel or triple burner identify where that would be placed in the body um, like middle jowl, what does that mean? Or so, what does sand jowl so mean? Middle, so we talk about the sand jowl as the three uh, jowls. Uh, uh, and so it is also a description. So yes, it's fluid metabolism, all that cool stuff I said. But we also use it as a descriptor of parts of the body as well as groupings of organs. And so our upper jowl is our chest. So I always like to say from the bottom of your ribs, from your diaphragm, up. And so we look to the heart and lungs as the upper jowl. Uh, the spleen, the digestion is the middle jowl. Uh, and that's your belly button to the bottom of your ribs. And then the lower jowl is below the belly button. We think about the kidneys and oddly the liver kind of ends up there in crazy Chinese world. Uh, the urinary bladder, the uterus, things like that. So we would refer to things like a uh, urinary tract infection, a yeast okay. infection is damp heat in the lower jaw, which just means there's lower some part of your body. lower part of your body has an infection. All right. So we, I'm going to add to like, we're going to add, we're going to get these questions answered, but I want to add that. Um, so the same person that asked you about the cough, question mm -hmm. says, so from a Western perspective, phlegm equals lax tissues. Yes. I answered yes until it Usually, dries. Yes, <laughs> exactly. I, I, I answered yes until it dries out, then heat and tension will be prevalent. And so I wanted to make sure that that got said out loud. Um, and so that there's that. The second thing is phlegm in that triple burner area, but I think it fits so well with the phlegm, sugar, stomach, yes. how do you get it straight related because of what they're asking, and that's why I made you clarify that. Yeah, it's, it's you know, and, and obviously I am horribly biased. I love me some Chinese medicine because of its diagnostics, um, in particular because of its diagnostics, because how do we get from eating something bad to the production of phlegm 
and I have to then move out of energetics in a lot of systems. I got to go back to medical, like I got an irritant, I've got a foods a leaky gut, blah, blah, blah. Um, so that like starts to move away from that sometimes and it can get a little bit more complex, honestly, than I think is necessary. Um, and so I'll, I'll really quickly, cause I know some of my students are on here and some of my newbies, but um, the idea of the digestion, the spleen, the agony in, in Ayurvedic medicine, is weak it doesn't do its job of transforming and transporting food nutrients water and it tends to go it, it basically will sit it will not go the direction uh and not be utilized by the body properly uh to provide the nourishment the chi that we need the moisture that we need to keep the muscles and the tendons all lubricated moving correctly um and, and so it, it's like that's just oh spleen chi tnt function doesn't work. You ate too much sugar. It turns to phlegm. It's it's so much easier sometimes when we look at it through that through that um, prism, if you will. All right. So if you have it that you think if you have it in a, an area that you think the sugar is triggering it, how do you bring that back into balance in the most um, broad way? Because we obviously can't do an intake, so we don't know they're hot, cold, but duck, dry. Duck. Duct tape over the mouth. No, no, no absolutely positive. <laughs> it's, a, it's an easy no, answer. It, Bitters, that, probiotic, yeah, push no. away from the table. So, you know, one of the things, I, sorry, I grew up in the 70s, uh, Pure White and Deadly, Sugar Blues, and I'm sure there's a thousand new books since then, but those were earth shattering back in the day as a teenager. And, um, the reality is sugar is an addictive drug. And when we looked at with the refined flowers and I would say even fruit, we, we've gone from, for those of you who go out and pick wild blueberries and strawberries, they're tiny tart little things, not these sweet uh, softballs that we can buy in the grocery store now. And so even our food has been manipulated to increase our sugar and I would argue our addiction to it. And, and I, I'm going to fall back on a little Chinese thought here as well. Obviously, cutting down with as we would with any addiction. And I do think of sugar as an addiction. Yes, um, it's thing. easier to think about it in the same way. If I were to change our language and put in alcohol, uh, when I talked about food, uh, I would say, we would say, are you crazy? And yet an alcoholic struggles to not drink in the same way that somebody who is normal in our society struggles to not eat uh sugar and high uh <laughs> high sugar content foods and if i said oh you're going to go blind heart disease obesity uh they're going to cut your feet off uh you won't be able to do all of these things the plaque will build up until there's no blood flow to your heart and brain you'd be like well of course i'll stop and yet there is an epidemic of of it and it's socially acceptable me for me to push a cookie on somebody where if i knew somebody was in recovery from alcohol uh, alcohol it certainly wouldn't be appropriate for me to push alcohol on somebody and, and so it it is a rough thing to deal with all of that as renee said getting the gut uh back in order with probiotics um but one of the things I like to do is because we put these mean value judgments on food and, and people who make poor choices in food, um, I like to encourage people, A, to eat cooked foods. Um, that tends to, to make it easy for us to assimilate and doesn't affect our, our gut biome the way uh, some raw foods do. But I would argue we in our uh, modern culture, we tend to focus on sweet and salty. Those are the only flavors we know. And I always talked about uh, to my clients, the idea of starting to incorporate new flavors and different flavors and foods. And so looking for sour, looking for bitter, uh, in particular, those two things help to counteract some of those cravings for the sweet. Um, so it changes the way they perceive it rather than I'm taking all of this yummy stuff away from them. And we can't deny it, that stuff tastes good and starting to change their flavor palette to incorporate some of those new flavors. So I'm giving them something new, not so much taking something away. Um, and so it is with any addiction, working on some of the mental emotional aspects that, you know, if I'm sad and I, I'm, I'm gonna sit there and eat the haagen -Dazs. if I'm bored, I'm gonna eat the potato chips, you know, and starting to look at those things of, what are those roadblocks for us for making good food choices? Um, and sometimes it's financial. Cheap-ass carbohydrates are way more affordable 
than, uh, you know, fancy organic vegetables. Um, so trying to find how we can help somebody make those better choices with their food. Okay. So I am, I'm answering this and it should be read out loud. Okay. So <laughs> I, I don't see all the, the gibberish. Okay. So one of the questions was, um, it was back before and, and hold on a minute. Um, Rachel, I'll get, I'll, I'll finish what I was saying and send it to you, but I'll say it out loud. So, so we started talking about halfway through that because we were back on the Jow and the, the bio thing. Yeah. So, so one of the questions was, yeah, that's what a happened. weekend, that's yeah. a weekend lecture. So one of the questions was what happens. And by the way, we're also on this thread about Bergner, Bergner and how, Paul. yeah. And that's what I said. I said, Paul's a friend. He's a great, excellent teacher. I offered Lily some of his teaching saying we have the whole program. Oh yeah. We've CD got his whole him. thing. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So one of the questions was, does it matter if you have a gallbladder? My response was, Technically, no, because your body still thinks you have a gallbladder. So the other organs pick up the slack. And then I said slight adjustments for kinds of fats and bile release. So then her question was bio question mark. And I started typing back. Yes, we need to make sure that we trigger in our, our ACL, our acids, our um, HCL. Yep. Sorry, HCL. Sorry, it's my knee pain is getting to me. <laughs> um, my The acids are triggered properly. We want to fully get all of the organs that are in the so, production of digestion yeah. working better than they were to help make up for that fat so the, the when we talk about the gallbladder it's really important when you talk to crazy chinese herbalists in particular because we have an energetic concept of a gallbladder and we have the physical little bag of bio juices there that are necessary specifically for digesting fats um, so if somebody's already lost their gallbladder to surgery the energetic, uh, the meridian, all of those things that we associate with Chinese medicine and acupuncture are still there. Those have not left the building. Um, it's only the physical manifestation of that gallbladder that's gone. Um, and presumably the uh, liver takes over some of that production of bile secretions for breaking down fats, but it does a poor job. Um, so we need help. And so, yeah, it gets harder. And so we see a lot of times in digestive enzymes, you'll see things like ox bile in there. That's designed to make that a little bit easier. And the problem is when the doctor yanks your gallbladder out, most times you got there, not always, there, there are many reasons why your gallbladder may tank. Um, but I'm going to say more often than not, it's from poor food choices. And they don't tell you you need to change your diet after they yank your gallbladder out. And so if you keep eating the fried foods, if you keep eating the high fat diet, you'll end up with a lot of digestive issues, a lot of stomach pain. Um, and you like, well, you took my gallbladder, but I still feel like crap. What's going on? And, and literally you didn't fix the reason why the right. gallbladder. So, so it's important that we start to modify our diet to limit the fats, make sure that they're healthy fats. And we can do things like both supplement with the digestive enzymes, in particular the uh, ox bile, but we can also use things to help spark the liver's uh, production and secretion of the bile um, with bitter stuff. So I want you to know what I said. Yeah. So then the next question that came down was veg and question marks. And I wrote back well cooked or macerated in some mm -hmm. way, if it's raw, yeah. a good balanced bitters formula. And yeah. I think it's important to understand that most of our bitters on the shelf are cold. Yeah. And we need to make sure that they're balanced well, that your formulator knows. So yeah. And, and that's really important. What Renee said, most of our digestive bitters, the liquid ones, the, the, um, Oh, I can't even think of the names of Urban them. Urban Moonshine. Yeah, Urban Moonshine makes some great ones. But those bitters frequently are very cold oh, energetically. Swedish bit bitters. Swedish, Swedish bitters. Swedish that's what bitters, I was trying to think yeah. of. Swedish bitters are, are, I think, fairly cold. Many of the renditions, I'm sure they have some warmer ones. So recognize hot and cold, wet and dry. And, and I think there was a question uh, that was sent in earlier mm -hmm. about uh, how do we, how is a bitter stimulating the digestive, uh, the bile? And yet many of those things that we use, um, like the coptis, uh, are very, very drying in their nature. And that is the joy of formulation. We usually don't use a single bitter. And although many bitter things are... Was that coming from Brittany? Yes. Okay. Can I... Can I... <laughs> it may, well, and yeah. so many of our, our bitter things are dry, um, but not all of them. And when we look at bitter foods, many of those are not uh, drying. And ultimately, it comes down to formulation, that we can add things in there to modify the dry, drying action. 
Um, and a lot of times that it, it's important to kind of read between the lines and interpret a little bit. If we have phlegm because of poor digestion, the agony, the digestive fire, the, the and so forth has gone out. If we spark that by adding herbs, it stops our body from producing the phlegm and therefore it will appear to be dry. Well, that I was about to say. And so some, some literally will dry you out. Like literally it's like, why am I parched? Why am I constipated? That's physically drying your tissues out. But other ones are starting to stop the thing that is producing the phlegm. And then if we formulate it correctly, we we improve the overall energetics, stop the dysfunction that's being happened uh, by a sluggish or lax digestive system. Okay, so let me let me try to because we have another gallbladder question that must come up. So let me try to like make sure we get these questions covered and that we go back. So so it started with the phlegm in the jowl mm -hmm. and it started with the sugar. Then we started talking about, do we need to have the gallbladder and why does our body think it? Then we go to Brittany's, is, is it yeah, stimulating? They're all that just, very it, much around the yeah, same thing. Is it drying? Mm -hmm. And so the perception that it's drying could just only mean that you are working correctly. Uh -huh. And then the other thing is, and there's a good question i just saw we don't talk up. about tnt it actually is that it's now transforming things that were stuck and sluggish so maybe we have that perception of well that. and a lot of times that tnt in chinese medicine the transformation, transformation there's actually is, a question before that yeah I, I i see one about the what makes a balance better i want to answer that um it, and so we can think about if we talk about that transformation transportation of stuff food water and so forth um that is literally the function of the gallbladder or, or potentially the, the liver in secreting bile for breaking down fats, that's um, transforming that. We're looking at the stomach acid, the hydrochloric acid of the stomach's ability to break down all of our other stuff, our minerals to stop bacteria, fungus, and viruses from passing to the digestive system. And then really, as we go down from the stomach, looking at the small intestine uh, and that kind, the, the chewed up food at this point, all of the digestive enzymes that come from the pancreas, all of that acting on that food to break it down, to absorb it, uh, it into the system uh, to be processed properly through the liver. That's TNT function. So it's all of those organs working together. It's your gut biome, uh, the mucosal lining of the intestines, all of their ability to uh, properly process the nutrients that we take in. And, and uh, Michelle, I want to talk uh, ever so briefly about uh, what constitutes a balanced bitter. And that's really one of the things that we like to beat into people's head. Um, so many herbalists can spout off the, the genus and species and the Latin names and the 27 different research functions of a particular herb or supplement. They, the problem is most traditional cultures didn't just say, here, St. John's Wort's for depression. What they did is they looked at the constitution of somebody. And in general, and, and, and I hate to say it, I've traveled way too much, um, uh, learning in the Caribbean, uh, here, Western Herbal Medicine, Nutraceuticals, 12-part uh, TV series with indigenous people down in Ecuador uh, and, and Germany for a couple of years. The, the reality is what we see is this reoccurring theme with traditional cultures and the way they understand the nature of disease, the nature of people, and the nature of herbs. And it comes down to this universal idea of hot and cold, wet and dry, deficient, excess, tense and lax. And there's nuance within all of it. And if you're studying Ayurvedic or Chinese or Anani Tibbs or wherever, the but the reality is if the individual is deficient and dry, that person needs something different from somebody who's deficient and wet or a person who's very excessive and hot or has an injury from a cold. Um, all of those things would necessitate that that individual gets a unique combination of herbs, not based on just its single action as diaphoretic, not its single action as to aid in digestion, but to look at it, whether an herb is hot or cold, i.e., ginger isn't spicy like cayenne pepper. It warms our digestion. It has a downward energy because it stops nausea. And we can change its action by dosing because if we do high enough dose, it will actually make you sweat. The opposite of that is watermelon, which is moistening, nourishing, and literally cold. 
Um, and so watermelon in the winter time in Canada would probably not be enjoyable. It's here in the summertime in Florida, where it gets really freaking hot, we love our watermelon. <laughs> and because it's cold, moistening, and nourishing. So what I want to add to this, because I'm watching the, the text go by. I know I saying crazy stuff. Yeah, here. what I want to add to this is so so what makes a balanced bitters in all reality? If you didn't have the person in front of you and you wanted to start at a basic base. It needs to be near neutral. And what we find yep. is all of our bitter components, all of our chili items, all the things that taste like bile to us or fingernail polish remover, um, those all have a cold tendency, not a cool tendency, a cold tendency. So making sure that our aromatics and our carminatives that help to move our stomach around and warm things up bring that back to that neutral state. So all you're doing is just adding other things in that um, – have the same characteristic of what you're trying to achieve and that base needs to be more at a neutral state and then you can move it both ways depending on who you're looking at and what their gut looks like um sorry and i know i'm skipping over some so uh amber if you're looking locally i hate to say it i, I was in a, a when i had the opportunity to run away to acupuncture school if i if i didn't have one here in saint pete when i decided to do it and the one here in saint pete's closed um, I would have never made it to acupuncture school, and that would have been sad. Um, the The reality is there's about five, maybe six in Florida right now. There's Sarasota has one, Orlando. Those are the two closest uh, they to get us. Their accreditation back in Orlando? Yeah, I think everybody's got their accreditation now. Um, that's always an important question to ask about any acupuncture school. Um, the reality is it's probably about the same distance-wise to Orlando, to Sarasota. I don't want to ever drive to Orlando, yeah, so that would be my same, personal opinion. It's not the same time, even that, though it's the same distance. And I would say most acupuncture schools are teaching a very similar curriculum. Sometimes they have great teachers, sometimes they don't. Kind of just depends on the luck of the draw. Some schools have a unique emphasis. We've got two schools in Gainesville. One is Five Element, which is uh, based on the Worsley system and has... A very different approach than many of the other more TCM, traditional Chinese medicine schools. Uh, and they do teach herbal medicine, but there's less emphasis on there. It's very much about acupuncture uh, and a unique diagnosis through the Worsley system, I believe. The other school there is also unique. Dragon Rises uh, is uh, run and was created by Leon Hammer, uh, who has a heavy, he was a psychiatrist and has a heavy emphasis on mental emotional disorders and pulse diagnosis. Um, I've hired two people from there over the years, two or three people from the Sarasota School over the years. Um, and then after that, it's kind of like if you could go anywhere in the U.S., I don't know, I'd always say, what's your interest and where's the weather nice? Uh, and perhaps also, where do you want to practice? Because currently, and this is supposed to change in the next year or so, if you're like, I can't wait to go to California, you mm -hmm. should go to school there because they actually have a California board exam that's different from the rest of the country. Uh, and you want to get established there. So when you leave school, maybe a few of your clients follow you from school and establishing that that rapport, understanding the business, know where you want to set up your practice or get yourself in with a local practitioner. So I would say go to the school that's where you want to live for say the next 10 or 15 years uh, and the one that you're comfortable driving to or moving to that particular city uh, and that maybe meets your need for particular interest currently. Some schools uh, are have very unique protocols that they're they're approaching. You know, if you're really into some esoteric stuff, there's uh, that Jing Tao and there's Jeffrey Yuen school and there's some other ones out west that are, are really unique. Um, so I'd say, eh, they're all about the same. You all got to pass the same board exams and the real learning happens when you get out of there. Okay. So I'm going to try to keep you on our, our list task. Yes, so yes. Other I than so the, rarely get acupuncture up. questions. Other I like it. Other than the energy <laughs> long haul of COVID, there's yes. still one more gallbladder bio Oh, question. Lordy. Um, what causes or what do you see to treat polyps in the gallbladder or other organs, TCM, Western, don't care, like, wh like, what do you know about that? What do you, you know, like, how, why do they form? How can we do something about it? 
that kind of thing. So it's interesting. Um, there, there's no single type of polyps. Uh, every organ. what would cause a polyp in the gallbladder? So or any other organ? I'm, TCM I'm western? not familiar with like stones or uh, kind of sludgy. Mm -hmm is very common but i don't think of i don't know polyps there so, but um in general whether it's a gallstone or a polyp those are phlegm uh, and so i would argue diet has a dramatic impact on any lumpy thing can i answer it from a cancer standpoint that that's a precancerous situation? and it can be that yeah like is, when we see polyps and they get removed yes. because so when we have what's called cell proliferation when a normal cell grows at a faster rate than it's supposed to, we get a glob of cells together, i.e. a polyp, um, a cysty thing. And we tend to see that being a messaging issue with that cell. And so those are the cells that are more likely attacked by something like cancer. And how we generally get rid of things like that or stop those from ever happening is that we're eating lots of antioxidants, we're eating less inflammatory foods, that we're getting rid of the cells that are damaged, like um, um, making sure that our immune system's working properly to see and receive that. So antioxidants for the deoxidation of the cell would be one route to go to, anti-inflammatories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's one of those things we're not supposed to have lumpy things in our body. Uh, and without a doubt, whether we look at it from an energetic standpoint or a physiological standpoint, if we have inflammatory things happening, poor diet, uh, stress, that causes inflammation in our body. And ultimately, our body responds by uh, we'll either see mutation of cells, uh, you know, the apoptosis isn't happening, we're getting uh, DNA is, is starting to get out of whack. Um, and so reducing our inflammatory load, whether that's through managing stress, eating better, supplementing with herbs, managing stress uh, is a big one. yeah, all of those things will have an impact on why our body is responding with inflammation. And, and it, it's always like, think about it, if I punch myself in the arm, I'm going to get some localized inflammation. It swells. And that's what's happening in our body. If we're, if we're eating, you know, sorry, for lack of a better thing, I don't know why Popeye's chicken just popped into my head. That is inflammatory. That's I me punching my, <laughs> that's me punching myself in the gut. And if I do that every day, I'm going to end up with some hard lumpy things probably in my large intestine that needs to be cut out. Um, and actually, I saw, oh, Michelle said it, it was like great advice for herb school as well. And I would say 100%. No, come to our school. It's the best. Um, no, the reality is it's there so are spe there are specialties within all of them. Um, although we teach botany, we're not the botany no. nerds. So in Florida, we are yeah. the one to go to. If you're yeah. in Florida, it, um, we could recommend on the eastern seaboard. And then once you hop over the Mississippi, there's a whole other set there, that we would recommend. Yeah, there's folks like Seven Song that are awesome, super geeky botany yeah. uh, and lots of first AD kind of thing, a very medical, uh, you know. So it or really Colin depends. Bond, yeah, call it, we love Howie. Mm -hmm. uh, so it always depends, like, I don't know. Which direction do you want to go where your interests are? And I would say also, if I plan to practice okay. in Florida, you ought to know some Florida plants. You plan to practice in Ithaca, New York, or hey, anywhere up I north. got something to say about that real quick, and that is I get crazy about people going up to schools to learn how to forage, and then they come and live here. And I have news for everyone. <laughs> None of those plants are here yeah. unless you live in Gainesville. And so I think it's funny. You need to take a, a class here. Yeah. All right. Where are we okay, at? Okay. So we're at... Any of these plus the energy for long haul COVID. So you can go right down like these people asked ahead of time. Yeah. I was starting to respond to Kristen's because um, I can do that. Oh, on yeah. The outside. Actually, well, let me kind of do that one because it's a it's a good one that may be relevant for a lot of folks. Um, so could you offer some advice how to help recover from a torn rotator, labrum, bicep surgery? Bummer. Um, aside from Solomon seal, turmeric, good nutrition, etc. Like, no, Solomon Seals, turmeric, and good nutrition is right on. So oh, Solomon Seal is an odd one for the Chinese herbalist uh, Huang Jing. Um, can you, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll type it. Huang, yeah. H-U-A-N-G, uh, Jing, J-I-N-G. And Solomon Seal is a Western herb. There's there's other types of Solomon Seals. Uh, it's a polygonum, if I remember right. Um, yeah, you got it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so... 
the Chinese kind of sort of use it the same way the Western herbalists do, but not really. But we can do it Western. And so I love Solomon's Seal for damaged tendons in particular. Absolutely. Uh, has some role when we look at muscles in how it attaches. That's ultimately the tendons on that. Um, and so it's moistening it's nourishing it's yummy the chinese it feels version like a tendon. yeah the chinese version has actually been steamed and so it has this stretchy chewy almost beef uh jerky. beef jerky like uh texture to it um so that is definitely one of my go-to's um uh, it, turmeric for everything if I, everything's I, healed comfrey comfrey and yes. if everything's completely healed like no scar um, I mean, no open wound, come free and solid. Yeah, and so that's really go. important. You know, after the wound is healed up or prior to surgery, come free is, is great. Um, plantain is also correct. I think pre-post-surgical probiotics, because there's usually antibiotics involved. 100%. Also, vitamin C is so important um, for reducing inflammation. And, and I'm, let me tell you a story. Um, when I was 11 or 12, I, uh, tore the medial meniscus, uh, in my, uh, right knee, right knee. Um, and this was before they had orthoscopic surgery where you get just like a little ding in your knee. This was the Frankenstein surgery along the, the thing and literally spent 10 days in the hospital from what today is a very simple surgery. Without and I was in a great deal of pain. Uh, and I think it was like the third or fourth day I woke up in the middle of the night. I probably rolled over and, and bumped my knee or something and rang for the nurse and said, hey, I need a pain pill. And I, I, I had probably been taking them uh, fairly regularly. It was probably just Tylenol 3. And uh, so the nurse came back a few minutes later and gave me something. I took it and uh, probably tossed and turned and finally fell asleep. And... When my mom came back in the next day and said, how'd everything go last night? And the nurse says, well, we gave him a placebo last night because uh, the doctor uh, thought that maybe we should start like weaning him off of any pain meds. And a hey, mom chewed that nurse uh, a, a new one. But the reality is we found out it was vitamin C that she gave me. And that's not a placebo. Yeah, it's not placebo. That is tissue generating, anti inflammatory, blah, blah, blah. So the reality is giving me two uh, capsules of vitamin C were as effective as the Tylenol 3 that she was giving me. And it's funny, as a kid, I learned a lot about vitamin C, big Linus Pauling fan, and all that. Um, but the reality is, I. I you know, I get way fancier now. Sometimes I just push vitamin C on folks, uh, whether it's cold and flu or post uh, pre post surgical. I just find great success. Uh, multivitamin, multimineral uh, fish oils is really helpful in uh, generating those tissues and reducing inflammation. So supplementation is super correct with all of that. Um, and there's a question. I'll answer that if you want to, or you can answer it. That's a, um, so oh. Michelle says, what about pleurisy root? I have never known pleurisy to have any connection with um, tendons, with the accepted, uh, exception of connective tissue in the lung and respiratory area that we haven't really um, had that taught as something to help repair yeah. tendons, cartilage or muscle. Yeah, I, I, I don't know it for that. There's definitely uh, a lot of, I mean, there's an endless number of herbs we can think about uh, in Chinese medicine, specific meridians. Acupuncture can be helpful. And, and there's, you know, debate how much can we use some of our uh, specific points, uh, both spleen, stomach, as well as kidney in order to help uh, bone and uh, uh, muscle tissue. But I would argue that the acupuncture can be useful for pain management um to if we promote the free flow of chi which is uh if we you know promoting uh, a painless opportunity we can pull some of that pain and inflammation out of that localized area give relief uh through everything from ear seats or, or auricular uh, acupuncture uh distal points uh oddly enough working on the hip uh will frequently help with shoulder pain so there's there's a whole slew of different ways that we can approach it i would say the opportunity like 
if we had an endless number of uh, hours in the day and an endless number uh, of dollars to work with, you know, what would we do? The reality is most of us don't have that. So we need to find those things that are the least expensive, most effective, uh, rather than I'm going to hit you with the kitchen sink and do chiropractic and this and that. And craniosacral is like, no, all of that's helpful. But I would say a little bit of acupuncture in the early stages would probably be helpful if there is a pain issue. Um, the probiotics, the vitamin C, zinc, uh, fish oil, Solomon seal, turmeric. Um, I would probably put plantain slash comfrey in there. And let me add one thing because it's Kristen, because she knows us. Yeah. So Kristen, if you're still listening to this and you can listen to the recording, that we it. make a tendon recovery yeah, salve, yeah. Not, to, not to push us out, but we make a tendon recovery salve. And I've had nine surgeries on one knee and my meniscus is totally like left the building and ripped right now. And I'll start feeling like it needs to be scoped. I'll put that on one time and then just go on with my life for the next three months. And so that's something to think about. And I'll, I'm happy to tell you what's in it. And you don't in any way need to purchase this. And I'll tell you how to do it for sure. The other thing is I wanted to ask you, Bob, yeah. because we're going through them. There's another question online. You want me just to keep adding it to the bottom? Yeah, of okay. course. So let's go ahead and address this. So one of I was, the things. I was going to yeah. say, do you want to answer so, that one so real fast? So one of the that's things that came one. up. And so we're talking about making this um, connective tissue sap. So yeah. one of the things that's on our question list that got sent in over the past week was, um, what kind of mortar and pestle which material would you use to best powder a resin? Like resins are very difficult to work with. And I'm getting ready to teach a, a, a medicine making class in just a week to one of our sets of students. And this is important because um, 20 years of screwing it up has made me an expert because I've gone through all the pain that you guys have. So there's lots of, of things that, that we can uh, say about this. The first thing is if you're working with a resin of any kind and you're an advanced student in some way, it's very, um, very much the easy cheat to make it a tincture and then make it a powdered tincture and then use the pre-extracted powder and then you don't have to worry about it. That's number one. So that's the first thing. But so most people don't know what the heck I'm talking about. So just throw that to the side. So the next thing is, it is really difficult, and please don't ever put your resins of any kind into your blenders. It'll ruin them completely. If you're going Tricks. to put it into a formula that has a resin in it, it's very um, important to always put your dry ingredients in first. So as you're throwing a resin into a professional blender, it gets the dry ingredient all around it and it doesn't stick to your blades. Otherwise, you'll stick those blades right into your cuticles trying to clean it and it's horrifying. I, I know there's one trick you taught me. Oh, yeah, I, and I, that was putting it in the freezer first. Yeah, absolutely. Especially if we're using the mortar and pestle. So, so mortar and pestle, if you put it into the freezer, it makes it so it doesn't stick and it breaks apart easier like shattered glass. But really, my most favorite thing is very very like folk herbalist and that would be to take an apron a sock a washcloth anything and take a frying pan to it so you just you just put it on the ground put it in a pillowcase grind it up put it on the ground and smack it with the frying pan like a cast iron pan and it tends to powder it nearly immediately but having it cold that's a that's a, pe a mortar and pestle. Oops, there we Having go. it cold is going to make it so that you don't stick. It doesn't stick. We use this one for reals. Yeah, and, and this is uh, brass. brass. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so a this is a very cold metal, and so to put a cold herb from your freezer into this, and you notice it has the little cover over it because we're sometimes we're literally smacking it really hard. And so it keeps all those pieces of the uh, thing from flying out. Um, so I personally prefer, if I'm gonna do uh, resins in particular, is to uh, use a metal rather than uh, the really pretty ones for making pesto and stuff that are like marble are great. Or, or, or wood, for, our wood ones yeah. I break all the time. Right, so, I, yeah. I would break those in two seconds because the resins we really do need to mash those things. And if I needed to, I could put if I'm like, ah, crap, I heat it up too much and it got stuck to this, I could put this whole thing in the freezer and I would be able to chip it off with a butter knife very easily if I needed to. Um, but I would say, yeah, resins are tough to work with. Uh, 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 high proof alcohol is a way easier way to work with those. But you can powder those and use them topically in combination with He's other herbs. Price. I know. Um, um, so, so let's recap real quick. If you're working with a resin, and you're skilled, make a tincture with a high proof alcohol, make it into a powder tincture, use the powder instead. 
That way you don't have to break it up. If you don't know what I'm talking about, completely ignore me. Um, best <laughs> to always put it in the freezer first. It will be cracking apart in smaller pieces easier and it won't stick once you get it to a powder form. I also like to put it into the bottom of a pillowcase, twist it around, turn it inside out again so it's double lined and take a frying pan to the back of it, like a cast iron frying pan. That's really <laughs> easy because it disperses and spreads out because it just ruins our, our mortar and pestles. And unless you have one that's got those brass um, strength to it, you're gonna ruin them. Like all the ones we use for the kitchen, our stone ones for guacamole, I break, I break them like a Thor regularly. And so the best way to do it really is to beat it on the ground with the, the pillowcase after it's been in the freezer. Um, so any more, you're welcome. Any more questions about that, just let me know and uh, yeah. shoot me up. And if any of you are here, and have been through the programs, or are you, if you're already acupuncture physicians or in school, um, periodically we do do medicine making Ooh, where you can come. Soon. It's coming up soon. We just have to know ahead of time because of COVID to fit you in. So we do have a medicine making class that's coming a two day next intensive, weekend. and then we'll have an advanced one um, a couple months later to go with the next set of students. Mm -hmm. um, let's go ahead and take one. This one might take me a few minutes, but um, about the long haul COVID folks. Um, and, and I'm going to be as specific as I can without going to jail. Um, and, and I'm going to preface it all by saying that. In theory. It, well, not even that, you know, it's like, that. you're not my patient. But um, but the reality is I've seen a couple of folks uh, in, in that realm and none of them are exactly the same. Um, and so what you had going on going into COVID and how, you know, if you did medical treatments, uh, other underlying disorders are, are, are actually going to be what dictates the actual approach to it all. Um, I do like Chinese medicine, uh, both its formulas and its approach to the, the long haul COVID. Um, there's some very specific protocols that they've created, but within Chinese medicine, all they teach is like, do this and this and this. Uh, based on the symptom pattern, uh, they also say, but change it based on 57 other factors. And, and so there's no, just do this and you'll be fine. There, There's a couple of factors that I've seen uh, with the long haul. I want to say most of my severe uh, COVID where they're getting hospitalized and so forth, my long haulers are frequently very low in their vitamin D. They are often dealing with uh, MTHFR issues. Do you uh, want to define what that is for people? A, 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 a MTHFR, also, pardon my French, uh, uh, oftentimes referred to as the motherfucker gene because it does not allow you to process B12 properly. And there are other reasons why people don't process or assimilate B12 well. And there's also a genetic variation. The, uh, oh my God. I forget what thalassemia. No, the, no, there's a for vitamin D processing. There's a genetic thing we talked about it last time. I totally can't think of the name okay, of it. It's all right. Three letters. Yeah, yeah. I'll Sounds get like it. no. Uh, I'll get it. it. And the symptom pattern of the long haul, the extreme fatigue. There, there's they're no longer considered to have an active infection. Sometimes they are. They're in and out of it. Um, they're very fatigued. Uh, they're short winded. Um, pale, uh, with a pale puffy tongue frequently, sometimes loose stool, sometimes not. Uh, so if they've done antibiotics, uh, it's important to start to use a variety of different probiotics. I literally tell people to change brands, uh, whatever you're taking, take a different one now. Um, if it's loose stools, make sure you incorporate Saccharomyces, Saccharomyces, uh, into the protocol. Um, and then VDR. Yes, VDR. Your re uh, VDR receptors. Yes, the VDR yeah. receptors is a genetic expression where it's no matter how much vitamin D, you got to take twice as much as everybody else. Um, the um, there's a couple of possible formulas, and actually, I'll type these in. Uh, Buzang Ichitong is right. a good one. Um, And there's lots of variations that can be done with that to specifically address it. it. We talk about it as for things falling down, but it's frequently just a weakened overall immune system. Um, a very basic Yuping Feng Song. Yeah, that's super basic. <laughs> uh, sorry. And then, uh, oops, Ban Chao Ho. One. 
Um, so let me define those. Buzong, Ichi Tong, uh, it's primarily a chi tonic with a lot of astragalus and some other herbs tossed in there. Uh, so we see Atractylodes, Astragalus, uh, Angelica Dongwai, um, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, those are the biggies. Ginseng. Um, Yuping Fensong is Astragalus, Atractylodes, and something called Sila Root. All of those are, if you've got easy sweating as the primary approach, we'd probably do some variations on that. And Bansha Hopawan uh, tends to be very phlegmy, uh, coughing, uh, wheezing, but a wet kind of thing going on. And um, a lot of Chinese uh, acupuncturists and herbalists will know that they, they go, Bunch of Hopa one, that's for plum pit syndrome, where they're, <clears throat> they're clearing their throat, they feel like there's something caught in their throat, there's nothing there. But we, if we look at what those herbs and we ex, we expand beyond just this sound bite of the, the idea of Globus Hysterica, uh where the the uh, yeah the the plum pit syndrome we can actually utilize that for a much wider range of things it's with that wheezing where it's uh hard to to breathe out where there's a lot of fluids if we started to see more wet and fatigue or excuse me more dry and fatigue or maybe there's some constipation we could go something and i would say modifying all of these based on the individuals sheng my son can become uh, a, a nice foundation. And that's very common herbs. The Mai Mendong is, um, I would say, similar to marshmallow. It's it's different, but it's uh, a similar action of that moistening, nourishing of marshmallow root. Uh, and then it's got Shazandra berry that helps to control the sweating and moistens the lung, uh, plus ginseng, which uh, also is moistening all of the tissues and fluids. I would probably really increase the Mai Mendong or do something similar to that if you're using Western herbs to really start to moisten things up. And I prefer the marshmallow to slippery elm with all of that. Oddly, the Solomon seal would be a good choice. Why do you prefer the marsh to the slippery? Uh, because it's too easy to screw up the slippery elm that you can cause constipation if you don't use the right water ratio. You don't find that with the marsh no. the same way? I, oh, I do. So I don't think. I, you think I, because it has a natural tendency to be wet yeah, and because it your, grows in the marsh? Your mallows in general are just moistening. They're just like you can't get away from it. Yeah, like you huh. can screw it up at some point. I have point. the same, I've, I've had the same cautions with both of them. So yeah. That's interesting. Uh, do we have to go to acupuncture school to do cupping? Not if you're so you certainly do need, licensed. Yeah, if you are a massage therapist and, you know, check your state's licensure, but uh, you can touch. I would say, and uh, Michael Tierra out in California, and I don't know uh, California's laws, he actually would tell you you can do cupping out there. Here in Florida, if you don't have a license to do some sort of tissue manipulation, i.e. massage, I you're going to get in trouble here in Florida without a license. Um, the, there, it, I'm sure it varies from state to state. Uh, I would say as a minimum, you need to be a massage therapist to do that. Although I think cupping is fairly easy to learn the basics and do it safely. Um, I, I, it's funny, we used to teach our students the fire cupping, but so few of them could utilize it. We, love it we we've we added something else into our barefoot doctoring uh, for all of that. Yeah, cupping rocks, actually one of our great, uh, great practitioners here, uh, Eva uh, just did a TV special on uh, cupping that I think we've posted on the website. We both posted. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's a uh, it's around. All right, what do we got left? So many things. And I like, and I, I sorry, I, I if you don't know Chinese medicine, if you don't have somebody, like you got to find an herbalist, even if it's online, to work with uh, 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 the if long you, haul because it is challenging uh, and it requires. I a have proper an herbalist intake. to recommend, Doctor Jody Noe. Yeah. Who she's helping yeah, to or me? Well, yeah, no, I'm saying, I'm saying, yeah. Of course, come to us always. But Dr. Jody Noe, who's up north, is working with several um, medical. She's a doctor as well as an herbalist as well as a Cherokee. Is working with several long haul clinics that have been set up in that whole New Jersey, New York, New England area. And so she has formulas out that she's welcome to send you. Plus, we can make you formulas as well that are similar for sure. Let's do a lighter one. Let's do baldness. <laughs> Okay, that's, so we got baldness. That's easier. So that's not easier. <laughs> you know. Well, it is and it isn't. So there's there's a couple of different reasons for baldness. 
Um, anything from uh, the the process t- testosterone of the body, the dehydrotestosterone, if it is not processed out of the body, we see baldness. Uh, it's the same reason we see uh, the prostate accumulates on men. And oddly enough, we see baldness happen in women uh, because of an elevated testosterone. And so it's associated primarily uh, with PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, where one of the key characteristics of that is the elevated testosterone. And women then become challenged with processing out the DHT. There's also the possibility of fungal infections, the hair follicles can get an infection in there. I got another one that's really or, good. Or anemia. Uh-huh. Uh, so one of the reasons we see the hair falls out during chemotherapy is people's uh, red blood cells and platelets start to go down. Um, and, I think they're probably referring to male pattern baldness. Yeah, I, I don't have any success. I don't even That's try. That's genetic. Yeah, what, so, blame, blame your mama for the male pattern so baldness. So before it falls out, we might be able to do something So about one it. of the things I primarily like to recommend, and you can do topicals of salt palmetto, uh, but mostly I use rosemary, and that's used topically uh, because it's a rubahashan. It brings blood to the surface. And two of the, th- if somebody is anemic and the blood's not nourishing and, and hair follicles are living things that have a little uh, ar- arterial and a little venial that, that go up there and it's alive and it needs to be nourished and fed. So bringing blood there will help to keep those hair follicles alive. Uh, you can mix that with the salt palmetto in case there is an issue with the the DHT, the dehydrotestosterone. After that, meh. Uh, okay. okay, so I have two things that go with that. We have a question, and I wanted to say something. Another thing that has come up with me in particular more than once, several times a year, past five years, I will have older ladies um, above the age of seventy-five that are generally brown, brown and black folks that are coming to me because their hair is getting thin and they don't want to lose their beautiful hair and they've done all the things right folk medicine that they know we we live in the south there's a lot of folk medicine down here and what i'm seeing in them is an elevated blood pressure like it's bubbling it out and they're choosing not to treat their blood pressure and it's it's a thing that i see often that i they say all the good things they've done for their hair And I say, oh, okay, so by the way, why, you know, why do I see this discoloration or why are you feeling so hot? Are you on any medications I need to know about? And really, it's the heat rising up that's really going to that. That that can do it. There's um, and then I'll tell you the question. Thyroid issues can can be a problem, both hyper and hypo. Um, And actually, uh, hair straightening products or Mm -hmm. bleaching products, uh, coloring products can literally make your hair fall out people. and um the there's another one in there uh where we get <laughs> alopecia um where in chinese medicine it's chi stagnation um is is a version of that because it's it can be totalis where all the hair falls out uh, but sometimes it's just little patchy round spots uh that's usually both a physical and emotional stressor where all the blood goes to the core Okay, so and so dealing with uh, chi stagnation, we can call that adrenal burnout, uh, uh, HPA kind of issue. But managing the stress while stimulating the hair growth and ensuring that the red blood cells and platelets are adequate levels. So making sure B twelve and iron uh, is being utilized and that the body is nourished with those things that are necessary to nourish the hair. I know what I would say about this, um, but I'm going to let you answer. Um, will not let you, that was rude, but, um, would inherited male pattern baldness increase a chance on prostate cancer? I don't know. So I feel like <laughs> from an endocrine system output, and I didn't, I didn't intro myself correctly that, um, while I was taking patients, my specialty would have been cancer care. Um, and so thinking from the prostate cancer side, the first thing is if you live old enough and you're a male, you probably have some prostate issues, period. Um, so just deal with that. But the, the, the endocrine system disruption that is um, blamed for male pattern baldness might lead to a disruption in your male hormones. I was going to say cause a higher endocrine, but the, the genetic male pattern baldness, I'm like, eh. I know, but what if it does? What if it has a, a link know. to it? And so I, we have I'd have to go. Yeah. That. So, so, <laughs> so here I'm telling you. If it's an endocrine system disruption and that's what's causing the male pattern baldness, baldness yeah. and has been inherited, 
yes, it can affect your chances to have any cancer 100% that are hormone dominated. And so in that case, yes. Why the person has male pattern baldness would have to be explored more because I right. swear that people don't agree on it and it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I, endocrine, uh, DHT, all of mm -hmm. those are an issue, but male pattern baldness being something that's genetic from your mama. Okay, so this one's a, a broad thing right here, that question right there. Um, these are... These are just oh, general. That's a great question. And I think I so didn't, too. I didn't remember seeing that and, one. And I have so much to say I about this. I totally want to answer that But one. you and I have, have seen these things together, so I think you'll yeah. answer the same thing as me. Uh, and, and I'll just read it off. Uh, way to go, Brittany. Yeah, that's a great one. Mm -hmm. uh, are there current issues you see a lot more than you did when you first started practicing? And I'm going to go, oh, hell yeah. yeah and and not in a good way. Now. Yeah. So mm -hmm. there's definitely, um, there's, there's seasonal things that come through. Um, but I, I'm sad to say I used to maybe have one or two, uh, clients at any given time with cancer. Um, and there was long stretches when I wouldn't see anybody or it'd be a prostate cancer that was very slow. And we were just kind of like, ah, just ignore it. Let's deal with some other issues. For the last two years, I have seen an epidemic of every type of cancer you can imagine where I think on a regular basis, I have seven or eight clients who are dealing with active cancer, uh, where they're going through surgery, chemo, radiation, or choosing to take more natural approaches that we're doing our very best to, to help them navigate that process or personally helping them in some form or fashion. Um, and I'll tell you what, that it's it's amazing when the, the blood work comes back and the cancer antigen markers are looking good or the PET scan is, uh, you know, showing a reduction in tumor size and numbers, but it's super hard work. And we're oftentimes working around prescription medications, working around the chemotherapy and so forth. And the other one. Wait, uh, wait can I speak on that real sure. quick? The other problem that we see with is more than medicines, not like pharmaceutical medicines, but we see this across the board. And remember, I said my specialty for years now, nearly 15 years, would have been cancer care that the second you stop taking the protocols, the second you deviate and stop taking the herbs, it's as if it comes back at a heightened level. Mm -hmm. And so that's another problem that we have. But but to add on to what Bob said, the amount of cancers I see that are hormone dominated double hormone dominated which seems like it can't be triple all different hormone dominated and the ability to deal with that and the only thing i can put it on really is stress and the amount of petroleum exposure we have things like all scents every scent you have that's not derived a hundred percent from a plant is an endocrine system disruption di disruption all plastics all plastic water bottles all plastic straws and so maybe it's that that's going on with it but more of his cancer clients, because I feel like I've accidentally given him mine since Thanks. I stopped practicing, more of his cancer clients are having more double dominance, more endocrine system yeah. disruption, and it's, it's a weird so, thing to see. And it, it, it's funny, and, and Renee said it, I don't know whether everybody heard it, but digestive issues has been a... Massive. That's, that's been probably one of the primary things I've treated consistently over 20 some odd years. It's, uh, it's been one of my specialties and sometimes it's really easy. Sometimes it's really hard. Um, I would say it has an impact on every disease. Uh, so it becomes oftentimes my starting point, uh, for a lot of issues. But the one I've seen more in the last, I don't know, since last February when we started this COVID insanity, I've seen more people uh, depressed, yeah. anxious, and disenfranchised Give and feeling alone than ever before. Because, uh, you know, yay, I love talking to all y'all, but I'd rather be talking to real people in my presence. And that's just not viable right now. And so I, I think not only... All we As want to do is talk to I, people. Yeah, right. <laughs> shut, shut us the hell up. Yeah. No, I, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. I think there was a level of disconnectedness that existed because of the internet and all of that going into this. And then this just uh, cut us off in a way that I don't think humans were prepared for. We are meant to live in and, community, period. And so folks who 
had community on the internet, but they also had a life outside of the internet that they weren't just text messaging people back and forth. All of a sudden, that little bit of exposure they had to create a tribe and to create friends and associates and so forth, all of a sudden that was eliminated through most of the world. Um, and so I, I feel like where I didn't see a lot of uh, young and middle-aged people struggling with depression, there's always a few, like, you know, everybody has their moments and, and sometimes very justified. I'm seeing a majority of my people are really upset and really suffering and feeling directionless that they are missing that um that interaction with a diverse group of people that i think is necessary we need a tribe we need to interact with a tribe we need a, a handshake or a hug or just to, i it's so frustrating like i i want to see people's faces when i go to look at their tongue i literally in some cases have forgotten what they look like. I want to put a picture of everybody's face from below their nose because I don't recognize people. And you know, it's funny, we were talking about the spiritual bathing. There was a, a young girl who her mom put her, or her grandma, excuse me, uh, could have been her mom. It could have been uh, her yeah, mom. Yeah, right? Uh, gorgeous. Grandma was looking good for grandma. Yeah. Uh, so this cute little girl, only a couple years old, and she wanted to know what everybody's name was uh, who was on camera because most of our students were on Zoom at the time. And and I was like, you know, it's so important that somebody see us, hears us, and that we say their name. And, and that's a challenging thing when my face is covered, you don't see me. I don't hear your voices. I see the words. Uh, and And so we become detached and unseen, and that hurts. I, I'll give you a... a uh, a, an amazing but sad and, and a little chilling example. I had a, a client a number of years ago with cancer. She was told to go home and die. Uh, she had stage four breast cancer metastasized throughout her body. And she was deaf uh, from birth. And this woman, you know, she was hey, already doing a good protocol. I know you're saying this to them, but I yeah. want to tell you that today I did something solely yeah. based on this oh, for nice. myself. I just and I don't sign, which was unfortunate, but she brought somebody along who could translate for her. And wonderful woman who was doing everything right at that point. Like they were like, okay, screw this. We're not doing all this other stuff. It all failed. So they started doing really good uh, work. They came to see me. We're doing raw herbs. It was awesome. And, and we kind of, she was progressing, but then she stopped and, and she wasn't progressing past a certain point. And I was like, she was frustrated. I was frustrated. We wanted those tests to continue to come back. And so I, I revisited uh, what was wrong. Like, what was your life going into this? And she'd had a close relative pass away that she was very close to. And, and I asked, were, you know, were you able to, you know, say goodbye and all of that? And I thought about it and, and it was still, I, I actually, I take that back. It was lung cancer. It wasn't breast cancer. It was lung cancer. And uh, it came to, she was like, well, I signed to him. I didn't say it to him. And I thought that, you know, a lot of times our emotions get trapped. And when we look at grief and loss and things like that, we associate that with the lungs. And I was just like, and, and we try to teach our students this and we all struggle with it. I struggle with it. We trust ourselves when we say something and we take it literally. I was like, you need to speak the word. She was like, I don't speak. I can't speak. And she makes guttural noises, but she doesn't speak. I was like, no, those thoughts have to come out of your mouth so that your lung is clear. And she's like, I don't think I can do that. And for this woman in particular, she, she, she knew she made sounds um, and she was, uh not embarrassed but she was uncomfortable with it she knew it made other people uncomfortable and and so i was like nobody else has to hear it you just need to have those ideas come out and so if you're making funny noises that's fine i was like go out into the forest go into the bathroom do it when nobody's home and it took her three months to do it and she came in one time beaming she was like i did it she was like i feel lighter and we continue to do the same things that we were doing and she'd come back about every month or so and I'd, how you doing she's 
this one time I was like, she was just getting better, better, better. She comes in, she's like, oh, I'm so tired. And I was like, ah, oh, crap, the cancer's back. Dang it, what did I miss? I've done something wrong. And I was like, so tell me what's going on. What were you doing yesterday? How's food doing all that? And, and she goes, well, I pressure washed our mile long fence and cleaned the house. I was like, oh my God, I wouldn't be able to stand up. This woman had more energy than me. And, and so it, it- Needless to say, she felt better. Yeah, yeah. It, and it was literally, that emotional thing of speaking your truth, speaking your words, even if no one hears it, uh, becomes such an important process to our feeling heard, being well, uh, and and having a tribe that we can uh, thrive with. Um, ah, okay, sorry. So, so another track. Because, Tell a dang story. Because well, there's another one. Tell me so, a couple so, of good ones. So you have you have this, which yeah. is. Um, leaky gut, SIBO, systematic fungal expressions, oh. uh, leave mushrooms alone or no. And uh. then we have a one that I thought was... Um, Opinions vary. Was Well, my opinion doesn't <laughs> vary. I know exactly what I think. The amount of mushrooms you should be eating is yes. Um, how does TCM treat something like hypogonadism, both in male oh. and female? I know he's oh. asking for male, for male, but I know for female, because it's an endocrine system disruption, for female, yeah. it, it's the same thing. It's an overexpression or underexpression of estrogen. And for male, it would be an elder yeah, expression or yeah, under Yes, and, and yeah. so hypogonadism, I can't even say it, um, can also be um, a genetic thing. And, and so because it's the reproductive organs um, and it is sometimes comes at birth and puberty and that, that growth and development, there's a concept within mm -hmm. Chinese medicine where we talk about the Jing. Uh, essence, it translates as, and it is the stuff we get from our, our parents, our mother and father. Our dog is being horribly he's, misbehaved. He's tonight. begging me for French fries, you guys. Yes, no French They're fries. They're organic the French fries, but French fries nonetheless. Um, and, and so that genetics that we get from our parents and how it expresses in an individual and our growth and development is the Jing. It is, and yes, from a medical standpoint, it, it is uh, hormones, jacked up in this. Um, and so, so what? As an adult, it's harder to affect it. Endocrine system support. Yes. Focusing more on one side than the other. So yes, depending on and without a doubt, it in because like dim would be helpful if you were if you had an under expression of one or an over expression of the other. Yes, there there's without a doubt. Okay. There's a lot of different approaches uh, to it, but to have a dramatic shift uh, of a proper, you know, to going from an underdeveloped to a proper adult uh, developed may not happen past oh, say the age of uh, twenty one. Um, to help with some of the side effects, the weight gain and so forth, uh, the potential baldness, things like that. Those are things that we can mitigate the symptoms based on how it's manifesting, whether it's an external influence, something like- um, And we certainly could support- For, so, for Marines who were at exposure. Paris Island, yeah, uh, we saw uh, breast cancer was uh, way shame. off the bell curve because of some of the estrogen disruptors uh, that were in the water, they suspect. And so we saw that, but then we helped to mitigate those, those side effects from that. Um, for those children, the, the children of, of the soldiers who were there, the Marines that were there, um, they're going to see a genetic expression probably for two or three generations down the line. And we're seeing it in the first and second generations already. And, and so can we start to mitigate that at, at a very young age? Maybe. I, I can't. I've seen some cases of that in adults. I've only helped to mitigate it. Uh, working with the transgender community on occasion, we can again the challenges of uh, helping with uh, the proper processing of those hormones, uh, some of the side effects of surgeries and so forth, without a doubt, we've had good success. But again, it's supporting people through that process, uh, physically, emotionally, and energetically. Okay, so let's, as I'm telling you, you're at 733. Ah. So let's, let's, if you want to, we can take one of those, or I can read you the leaky gut mushroom question it's up to you if you want to delve into that but i think it's in relationship to 
does it like, you know, should you take nutritional yeast if you have a candida infection? I think it's also in reference to something like that, like a fungal infection. So the, so do you, which one do you want to go for? Do you want to go for um, candida overgrowth herbs and, and treatments, simple uh, ways so to stimulate let, Well, hunger. if there's candida, there it kind of all falls into the same thing. Okay. Well, it also so, herbs for intestinal inflammation too. So, that yeah, kind of so that, I, I get almost all so of them So let there. me read the question just so you can get it fully because I, I, I uh, <laughs> did it just did, there. Yeah. yeah. Would gut-related conditions like leaky gut, SIBO, systematic fungal expression, or other Thank you ones, for saying all of those, by the way. You saved me having to say all of those. All benefit from medicinal muscles, mushrooms, powders, or extracts, or would you refrain from a multi-mushroom extract or powder um, for a safeguard in any of these conditions? Now, I don't know if you and I are going to disagree on this, but I know because of the extensive amount of mushrooms I have to use for the cancer, I know what I think about there, this. There's, and, and for cancer, yes, and it's the I know, gut be damned. But I, but, but I think that we need so more mushrooms in our life. The mushrooms are generally good. Their their role in our immune system uh, is phenomenal. I, I, a huge fan of mushrooms, um, especially cooked. I think that that is an important aspect of it. Yep. They're cooked. Well cooked. And, and we, we see a lot of disagreement in the community. Um, we see in the IFA community that yes. they actually forbid oh. any mushrooms, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and feel free to correct me on that. You know that realm better than I. Absolutely. So let's, let's uh, have a quick conversation about traditional healing so that all traditional healing that is going to be out of the premise of the earth. So that if you have, um, you pay homage to the elements, if you pay homage to the earth, if you have deities that walk around that represent those things, lightning, Thor, things like that, um, Eshu, things like that, your consumption of mushrooms generally means you're consuming something that has eaten death. And in our world nowadays, because we embalm bodies and because animals just lay on the side of the road and get poured into our sewers, that no consumption of mushrooms from a traditional healer, especially an herb gatherer, like a medicine person, is acceptable from the spiritual context of consuming something that ate bad death. Now, there's differences and weirdness around that, but just letting you know that is a thing. So if you're taking clients, be very careful. If they in any I, way I represent say we have a, island, West African, Gullah, We have Angola. a lot of practitioners mm -hmm. on here. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of your students, I mean, but it, that's a really important thing. We don't need to sit there and, and uh, ask people their religion per se. Um, but it is important if somebody says, I can't have mushrooms, that we respect that wholeheartedly. Um, or it's a great opportunity to ask questions about why and what that is. Um, it's wonderful to get educated by somebody. I have some uh, very uh, strict Jewish patients mm -hmm. that are very kosher. And I, I love the fact that they educate me about what, what is kosher and what they're, yeah. while, what they're allowed to do, what they're not allowed to do. Uh, and, and ultimately, I, I always say, I, it's like, what a reasonable religion, because for your health, you can do whatever the heck you need to. Doesn't matter. Um, so the so going back to the the gut stuff, the there are many different beliefs, uh, and people are are in one camp or the other. There is no wavering on that, and I hate to say it, I I, I, I clearly express uh, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I tend to take a very middle road to a lot of things that that included, and I could I, be defined as extreme. Yes, without a doubt. Yeah. When it comes in, I would say every case is, is super unique because in the case of something like SIBO, um, I think, you know, with small intestinal bowel growth, uh, I think it is important. And I would say many of those other times of get, gut dysbiosis kind of ideas, um, we need to kill off some stuff before we start to nourish and repair. And so sometimes the killy part isn't very nice. Uh, the herbs are horrendous tasting. And there's oftentimes flu-like symptoms, diarrhea, cramping, all kinds of yuckiness. I try not to do that. We try to take a kinder, gentler approach to it. And then as we rebuild, I find that the mushrooms aren't an issue anymore. There's also some people who, you know, if you've got a, a gut permeability, leaky gut, whatever you want to call it, they're reactive to a lot of stuff. And they can also be reactive to a mushroom. It's not like, oh, and mushrooms are exempt this week. 
Um, so we may find that there is a negative response, especially if mushrooms are their favorite food. Uh, if they're getting them from a less than ideal source so that there's actually other stuff on there like cow poop. Um, and so we can look at things like food combining. If you're eating mushrooms and having some sort of a mast cell or histamine-like response to it, we can add in some things like burdock or stinging nettles in order to mitigate that because the nutrition, the immune modulation aspect, the blood pressure lowering, jing nourishing, the cancer resolving okay, properties so of mushrooms are answer? rocket. What's your answer? Sometimes. I call shenanigans on that. So if you have this huge amount of phlegm that you've got SIBO just kicking your butt, I mushrooms are not my first choice. So if you have uh, an immune related issue, if you have stress related hypertension, I would probably use them. I think mushrooms are awesome and I prescribe them regularly. Um, in cancer, I consider them vital. Your gut be damned. I, I don't care. So there isn't a single good answer for all of that. But I will say mushrooms are awesome. It is rare that I will restrict them. It becomes a question whether I specifically prescribe them. Uh, that then becomes the bigger issue. I like to clear up the phlegm and start the healing process of the gut. Um, so if there's candida, if there's just SIBO phlegm kind of thing, whether I'm using caprylic acid, oil of oregano, uh, berberine containing stuff, uh, Smilax or any number of other possible herbs that I can use, uh, to kill some stuff and as quickly as humanly possible starting to repair things. We usually see in the case of uh, mast cell issues, MAC, um, some of the, the various yeast and bacteria things that suppress the immune system, the sooner we can start to repair that immune system, uh, ideally with the right mushrooms is a nice gentle way, but I would say our our chi tonics, things like buzong yi tong, astragalus, attractylodes, uh, can be a vital part of it all uh, in that healing process. So if for whatever reason we choose not to use mushrooms, we got options. Um, but some of those mushrooms, the cordyceps, reishi, turkey tails, uh, poria, are just magical. Um, so I, I rarely refrain from using them unless uh, there is good reason not to. So I, I, I'm i not a fan of protocols. I'm a fan of what's going on. Let's see where you're at and then making the best choices humanly possible based on medical, energetics, blood work, you name it. We got lots of different ways to uh, ascertain it. And things like I, I'm, I'm going to be lecturing at the Florida State Oriental Medicine Association in August. Fasoma. Uh, Fasoma. Uh, on, uh, we're calling it something like stomach chi. I forget the cool name, but it's really going to be about kind of what you just said or what that question was because the role of low stomach acid, the low HCL, and the role that that has for setting up SIBO, Candida, IBS, blah, 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 blah and how we can recognize it and approach it. And I think, especially with SIBO, we frequently will see uh, low HCL or the overuse of uh, antacids, H2 blocker kind of issues. <sighs> okay, Next. we are at quarter till, basically. <laughs> Roughly, we're at a quarter till. So are you going to choose, uh, you want to choose candida overgrowth? We've discussed that kind of. hit that. Um, simple Don't things eat to sugar, stimulate, take probiotics. Simple things to stimulate <laughs> hunger. Chinese herbs for intestinal inflammation kind of talked about. We didn't about. specifically mm -hmm. say that. No. But lymphatic cancers ugh. related to infections. What this is meaning, what Brittany's wanting to know, I know this I think she's talking about not panda because that's not cancer, but things like pandas where where you have like a virus that then triggers an infection that may. So let's generically let me yeah, let let's me talk, talk about, about that. Because Are some I've... lymphatic cancers related to infections, and that's what she means that correlation so, between a virus or something. So there there are many there are many types of cancer. There's no this cures cancer. That's BS. 
Um, and there are many causes of cancer, everything from genetic to environmental to, I would say, stress. Don't, don't pick that up. I just want to make sure it wasn't one of the kids. Yeah. Um, so, so we always have to be careful, of, you know, that we, we properly define what type of cancer, where, um, you know, Western medicine is really good at defining that. And they continue to refine and define it as we understand genetics and the genome project and all of that. But I think more important um, is the idea that infections can lead to stuff, cancer being one of them. HPV is a viral infection that turns into a cancer. I just read all about that today. Yeah. <laughs> that dream I have. And, and the, there are other ones that can come from that or the damage that a virus, bacteria, fungus can cause that creates inflammation or uh, genetic cellular damage that leads to cancer. And, and it's really fascinating in Chinese medicine. Um, there's, I just taught a bunch about this. There's two theories, the Wen Bing and, uh, the Shan Hun Lun. Uh, yeah. Okay. I spelled that wrong, but whatever. Um, <laughs> boy, I didn't even come close. That's two different words, Wen Bing and Shan Hun Lun. And I left off a letter or two. And um, one is the, the Shang Hun Lung is the transfer of cold disease and how we catch a cold. And that is virus, bacteria, fungus, uh, or how we catch a heat. And that would be the wind bing. And how that invasion of a, a virus, a, a pathogen, can a change and affect the body and how it transfers through. And so the Shang Hun Lung in particular we see how it slowly goes into the body and attacks us and can create a weakness and debility in the body and in the immune system that can actually damage both the energetic and the physical uh, organs of the body, leading to death. I would say that idea of external uh, pathogen attacking the body fits well into the Shan Hun Lun. And I don't know, I, I won't say I'm an expert at the Shan Hun Lun, um, but the the idea that that can happen, and there was uh, it just happened today with uh, one of our students was happened to be in the clinic today, and in I, I it was admin day up until this, and uh, she asked me a question. She had a dog that already had a, I think it was like dementia or something, and the dog got a vaccine uh, and probably a distemper or rabies or something, and. Uh, <laughs> that the dog had a really bad adverse reaction to that where it was causing new set of symptoms as well as a worsening of them. And I, I am not an anti-vaccine. I'm a fan of appropriate uh, care where it's appropriate. I think we over-vaccinate, but I'm definitely not against them. Um, I just don't want any personally. I've had my share. <laughs> um, so when we put a needle in somebody and inject you with an invasion, a pathogen, whether it's a dead virus or a live virus or a half dead liver, our body is supposed to respond to that and create antibodies. And if it over responds, it's a demonstration of an issue with our immune system that over responds to it. From a Chinese perspective, we've actually injected a, what I would argue is a wind cold, especially when we look at the additional chemicals in there, uh, a, a cold pathogen into the body that our body may not handle well, especially if we're already deficient. And so I, I actually recommend using cold and flu herbs uh, in those early stage kind of ideas. But if we recognize that there is a path pathogen that has now hung out and think HPV, that's just an easy uh, uh, human papo, uh, Virus. <laughs> Thank you. It's been a rough hour and a half. Um, and and uh, the HPV that we can understand, it only was able to take a uh, hold in our body because our immune system did not respond properly. So strengthening the immune system at the same time that we attack this pathogen. And when we look specific, and, and here's the trick, there is no all cancers are caused by a pathogen some cancers are. And we see that too often there, I, I we have a, a clinic near us where I know that their belief is that 
all cancers are caused by parasites slash pathogens because I see their folks come see me if they're not happy with the care they're getting there. And when I look at the herbs that they've been given, I was like, they're just trying to kill parasites. They're using black walnut and uh, sweet ante and some things like that. And it's not bad if that's what it is, but if it's a hormone one, that's not going to work. Uh, and so this, it's always is all, <laughs> if you say all of this disease is caused by, you're going to fail sometimes. The, there is no single cause for, for anything. So that idea of that is when we're dealing with a pathogen related, strengthen the immune system, find things that are appropriate for that virus and address the cancer and its unique properties with it. So really, we're almost looking at a three prong approach when we have a pathogen re uh, related tumor or even if it's a lymphatic. Uh, that we need to address it in those different ways. So it's definitely one of the more complex things to deal with. Um, cancer always is because there there is frequently medications related to it. Um, there's emotions related to it. You know, I, I've had to deal with cancer for, with both of my parents um, and not with myself. And so those decisions that I think I would make um, is a nice thing thought but the reality is none of us know until we're there uh and so dealing trying to not push somebody in a particular direction but allowing them to make decisions that are correct for them while dealing with that uh particular issue uh is really important so um i have i have one thought one thing to say about that and then um i'll give i'll feed bob another question he's got 10 minutes left ish um and that is Anytime we have cell damage, anytime we have any difference in the body, any stress in the body, it's an open gateway for something else to attack and, and get in, unless we, we deal with it and move it off to the side. And so that's just the way to, in a general sense, to think about that for sure. And so other than the question that has just come up, and I'm happy to read through it if you want to, Bob, you have your choice. You only have 10 minutes. So you have your choice of stimulating hunger, intestinal inflammation, um, things that come about by a good herbal education that, already. that we already did yeah. that. Um, and then this new one that has come up here, you want me to read Let it me, um, Yeah, that one looks interesting. So hold on just a second. Just, okay. you know, we got a bunch of folks here um, and I'm going to answer like one or two more questions, but I want to make sure for Nine any minutes. of you who are jumping on that I'm Bob Lindy, I'm an acupuncture physician and a registered herbalist in Florida. Mm -hmm. This is Renee Prince, my other half, uh, who is also a registered herbalist here in Florida. Um, we're the Tradition School of Verbal Studies, and we encourage you. We got our classes online, live with Zoom, as well as in person. And uh, we've got Western Herbal Program, it's, Chinese Herbal Program. Up. and It's um, really important that you guys know, like just like us doing this free night, anytime we have a, time, a day off, we try to make free videos and put it on our YouTube channel for you all. So we have monographs that are there. We have us talking about certain um, illnesses. You have us talking about so, certain things like bioregionalism. So the YouTube channel, you so get more of this. We hope that you uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're, we actually have the weekend off, which means we're probably going to go play we'll in the woods and we'll end up recording tomorrow. something. Yeah, so, we'll record something. And that will be uploaded to the YouTube channel. So if you want to be the first to catch it, and there's probably a uh, hundred or so videos there on everything from spiritual medicine to herbal medicine okay, let's uh, to herb walks. So all I, of that's there. I feel like this is a loaded question. So I want to get to Yeah, it. go for it. One last question, if there's time, mm -hmm. when it comes to H. pylori, are there Western or Chinese herbs that can be combined? Um, thinking about things like berberine containing plants, um, clearing infections, um, mastica, um, then it goes forward to say, um, to clear infections entirely, or would it, be like a few instances like Lyme where synthetic antibiotics are definitely needed okay. or indicated. Yeah. And so, yeah, lots to so, say here, lots of things. And uh, yeah. I will I will say this as quick as I can. Um, and, and by the way, we're doing this at the end, of whatever the last Friday of the month is for next month. I, I kind of mark that on my calendar for the next few months. So, it's so uh, I know the next two events are there. So go ahead and uh, put that you're coming so you get the notice uh, that we've gone live on the video. I try to start it about 10 minutes prior to the class and we'll upload this whole thing up on YouTube probably sometime this weekend. Um, so. H. pylori is a bacteria that we see an overgrowth of that that's related to uh, stomach ulcers, 
um, digestive issues in general, but specifically uh, ulcers. The standard medical treatment is uh, about two weeks of antibiotics, which obviously it's effective, but it causes 10 new problems. Um, and when we're looking at that, there is some decent research out there uh, for everything from the berberin containing things. So in Chinese medicine, we would look at the Huangs, Huang Qin, Huang Ba, and Huang Lian. I would probably look at Huang Qin and Huang Lian. Uh, Huang Lian uh, leading the parade, that's Coptis. Um, but I think it's important to add some of your mucilaginous herbs in there as well. So we got a lot of these dry, killy things. The mastic is, is great from Anani Tibbs from the Middle East. Uh, we could use frankincense and myrrh in a similar ways. They're Tissue related. Healing, so it starts to... Yeah, but it's a lot of killy stuff. There's a role for licorice in that, but we have to be careful with licorice because it can affect the potassium balance, increasing high blood pressure. And sometimes that's an issue with folks who have got, you know, H. glory gets out of whack, both from poor food choices, but stress will even throw it out of whack. Let me, let me say something real quick about what Bob just said about the resins. So our H. pylori gets crazy and gets way out of control in some cases when our when more our ulcers are getting worse and so i.e if the ulcers were healed it wouldn't be in an overgrowth so adding things in that are tissue knitting and um, returning that gut biosis back to where it needs to be will help on its own just reduce it naturally but i think there's also you know obviously addressing food and all of that it's not wrong to take the antibiotics and so because we can clean that mess up we, easier. yeah we can do you know we can be taking the probiotics with that we can be working with them for the dietary changes and so in the case where there's already a bleeding ulcer like there's blood that's dangerous and life-threatening so the faster we get those uh, the h pylori killed and we can start to come in and start to heal that tissue the better but in the same sense it's like eh, if we're getting there it's starting to show it's some overgrowth we're starting to get some pain I, I'm a fan of us trying if the modification is going to happen in, in the in, we need to identify what's the behavior. I, I got my um, hat handed to me the other day in one of our Western 101 classes because I was saying something about ulcers and poor food choices, alcohol. I, I was going to say I had something to say about all and, this. Yeah. And I had a woman who said, no, I had a you know bazillion bleeding ulcers and I am the most perfect eater in the world. And she was. And she was like, it was stress. And so stress can be just as much. And we may be using food to, to uh, help us mediate our stress, but stress alone will cause a disharmony in the digestion. So there's not a, we have to know why and we need to, you know, Western medicine, thank you for letting us know each glory is an issue that we got to use some killy stuff. But treat the pattern that you see, use the Western research, the rest of Western knowledge. And sometimes we're the better choice. Sometimes the MDs are the better choice. They are good at heroic medicine, i.e. if you're going to die, you get hit by a truck, go to the hospital, do all the drugs, do all the surgery, and then let the herbalist deal with the chronic issues that are caused by all that because we're really good at that crap. And that said, if we are able to address that uh, chronic digestive issues of H. pylori before it becomes critical, then we can definitely have a role in repairing it uh, at the front end to, to get the H. pylori back in balance because it belongs in the system. It's only when it becomes an overgrowth that's an issue. And then repairing the tissue damage, uh, working with that person to either modify their stress, modify their dietary habits and so forth. Um, and ultimately it may require a team of people. Uh, people to correct it. I want to say something about this from an emotional standpoint, since mm -hmm. we have so many practitioners that are online as well. I know. I love it. Um, back in the day, like us 20 years ago, we probably would have had something more rigorous to say about medications. But what I want you guys to be impressed upon, I don't know if it's my old age is making me soft or what, is we are not, rub it off on her. We are not to come to the table in judgment period mm -hmm. so that if somebody needs to it you you are not to judge yourself if you need to get yourself out of something by taking a pharmaceutical there is no judgment over that if you overeat 
drive through donuts because that's what makes you able to cope with what's about to happen after drive through donuts. You do what you've got to do. And we're here as community healers to support you in the best way that we know how. And I got a herb for that. I'll fix that. I'll help you with one, one of the things I also like to say, a lot of times folks after ulcers, no matter what the cause, after they do their two weeks of antibiotics or herbs and, and so forth, is they're put on uh, H2 repressors, some sort of antacid, acid point. reflux yeah. meds. And they're put on those for the rest of their life. And that I'm not a fan of. Um, if somebody does that for a couple of months whilst their gut heals, then so be it. I, we have to heal those damaged tissues, the mucosal lining of the stomach, I and still protects think we us from do it, it without doing that. And, and very possibly, but uh, the the reality is the long term use of those medications a is not tested past one year. Um, it is guaranteed to reduce your absorption of all of your minerals. Uh, probably your B12. It allows for uh, bacteria, viruses, fungus uh, to pass through into the small and large intestine, creating those things that we mentioned earlier, like SIBO and so forth, uh, to set us up for uh, C. diff, uh, which is can be deadly, especially in the elderly. Um, and so the long-term benefits of that acid reflux med is not your friend. So short-term, it's fine. Long-term, it will freaking kill you. So... <laughs> Sorry, that wasn't very medical with me, was it? Um, so, <laughs> so I thank you all so much. We've got a bunch of classes coming up in the very near future. Um, I hope you join us for some of the ones in person or online. Doesn't matter whether you're nearby or far away. Um, check out the YouTube. Make sure you subscribe. Join us for one of our Thursday night, more spiritual focused classes, one of our free classes on a Friday. We'll do this again and do our very best to get through another 57,000 cool questions uh, a month from now on the last Friday of February. Um, and we've got a 101 class, which is the beginning, that's the gateway drug into the Western Herbal Program uh, that is a standalone class especially effective for you folks in Florida, but we talk about herbs from around the world, 30 herbs you can't kill anybody with unless you work really hard at it. Um, some basic medicine making and lots of other cool stuff. And we definitely push the envelope even for those who are more experienced. So thank you so much. This is Bob from Renee. And this is the Tradition School of Herbal Studies. Good night all on the dot. <laughs> <laughs> Check for this uh, re being recorded on YouTube. We will upload it here in the next few days. Bye. Nice. Good night. Good job, Bob. <laughs>